Hi, my name is Philip Beither. I'm the curator for performing arts here at the Walker Arts Center. And with me is choreographer Beth Gill. Mm -hmm. And last night here at the McGuire Theater at the Walker, we presented Nailbiter, uh, co-commissioned work by the Walker. And congratulations on the success last night. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. And thanks for having us and commissioning this work. And it's been <clears throat> a long and wonderful process. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I wanted to ask you last night, we had a brief talk, and um, you had mentioned that um, your 2016 work, Catacomb, mm. prompted you mm -hmm. to be sort of sourcing material and thinking about what inspires the creation of your works differently. Could you mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, maybe... Is that, was that in, in a sort of in a, or inaccurate assess, uh, uh, takeaway from what no. you said last night? Yeah. No, 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 not at all. I just was pausing to think about, you know, so what I, what I shared last night was that <clears throat> I remember the junction between two different processes. One was Newark for the Desert, which was 2014, and then there was time and then the other one was catacomb sorry there was time in between them yeah and and i i think i i i think i was also processing what felt a little bit like personal failures that i perceived with the newark for the desert um and in particular ways that concept as a sort of overarching kind of structure holding a work um felt like it had kind of like let me down or i mm. in some way and um or approaching a work from that kind of vantage point and it got me thinking about the fact that i've you know i i made dances as a young girl I like made dances all the way back to like when I was 11 and or earlier I don't know I mean there were like mm -hmm. creative it just was a creative space and um and I was I grew up basically in a dance school so mm -hmm. um and I think when I started to think about that there was something quite um intuitive and just simple about the way that that creativity was moving through me as a young person, of course, right? That's always the case. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I, I was just sort of longing for more of that. And I just started to think about the role of imagination, but maybe more specifically the role of like kind of dreaming or visualizing. Mm seeing things and just sort of set an intention with catacomb that i wanted to start the process that way hmm. i wanted to start in an unknown like really with a kind of invitation to be in a sort of unknown relationship to what the thing was and let it kind of emerge but not even like in a um I think people do that a lot, actually, like in the studio, working with ideas. But I guess I meant more just in myself, like mm -hmm. where the work gets kind of set mm. initially. Um, and that ended up, I think, being a really meaningful shift for me. Mm. And one that I've continued to just practice with each successive work since then. I do feel a little bit, I mean, who knows? I don't know what is going to happen up next. Right. But I do feel this kind of, like, Nailbiter feels almost like maybe the end of a, ser of a, a cycle, cycle. Uh -huh. a little uh, bit. Interesting. Um, because one of the things that, there are things that have happened as a result of that kind of shift in working, which is... Um, but it also sort of happened with Brand New Sidewalk and the way I was approaching that work, which is... Which was it, our last work Which together. was our last work here at yeah, Walker. And yeah. that, that piece was this, um, this sectional, but really more almost like this kind of triptych. Mm -hmm. And it, 
it started this way of working for me where I really was like building materials for a dancer. Hmm. I mean, there is a, there's the unison duet in that piece, but right. the, the, like these really, like I, I'm not making a, an ensemble work, you right. know, yeah. I'm making something that's really like composed um, in I don't think about it in terms of collage, but at least in terms of the the sort of particularities of each role. Right. Um, anyway, that all kind of was also starting around the same time as this shift that I'm talking right. about. And I just feel like I have been noticing myself now wondering about ensembles or wondering about mm, groups right. and wondering yeah. about other things and that that signals to me maybe i'm <laughs> i don't yeah, know yeah i right. feel like a kind of completion or yeah something. when you first um made that shift before catacomb did you feel like it was kind of a stepping back from a predetermined choreographic structure that was laid out in advance kind of and then dancers were applied to it um kind of and instead you created as you went and based on the dancers you were working with and things like that. Also, I'm curious if you found that you tapped into a sort of a subconscious within yourself to sort of shift into the catacomb, brand new sidewalk, nail biter era. Well, I, w I would almost be curious like your take on this, but you know, when I was first starting to make work, you know, I, I got out of school in 2003 in yeah. New York so early 2000s and what i what i think i was experiencing then was the the like continued waves of like european conceptualism right you know that were like like still washing sure. over new york uh -huh. and somehow the combination of that and also the way the funding systems right. kind of work, I think I just felt a lot of pressure as an artist to to have certain kinds of questions and certain kinds of conceptual frameworks mm. in place mm. as a kind of like primary scaffolding for the right. work yeah and as a young artist i think you don't always understand the what conditions you're responding to yeah you know and so i think part of what was happening with catacomb was also me trying to just kind of extract myself a little bit mm. from some of that and find my own footing um, but the other part of your question is really about just on a personal level, I mm. feel like I, there was a relationship to psychology that was emerging for me just mm. through my own <laughs> practice of going to therapy and, and just being really fascinated, yeah. um, and being really curious, I think also about what kinds of psychological processes were happening in the room with my dancers maybe not in ways that are so direct but even just in terms of like who are they to me how am i projecting myself like how am i building almost like a psychological workspace for right. myself like yeah. through the creation of this work and i think that that has really mean that that has become a part of or, or a way that i'm thinking about what i'm doing mm. um that there's a there's there's like there are different layers of process and they are feeding each other mm. um, some of it is like just like my own slow process of evolving kind of in the, my own like sort of evolving consciousness and mm -hmm. um, 
and then and then the work has its own thrust as it right. starts to take shape and mm. it's like moving and it's evolving and then it starts to kind of reveal things to me that that right. that feed back into like mm. some of those kind of more personal questions yeah I don't know if that made sense. Yeah, totally. And you were referring to the, your evolution as a director and say 15 years into your work, um, how that shifted and the shift related to this cycle of work that started with Catacomb. Could you talk about that a little bit more? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think that one thing that's really emerged in this work cycle, which we've been talking about mm -hmm. as kind of initiated with that project catacomb and sort of extending through to this one. Um, I've really felt myself develop as a director. Um, and also, I mean, I'm in this piece, but I really don't like being in the work. I really like being on the outside of the right. work. And I think my work really benefits from that. But, um, but I guess I was, as you were talking about the dancers, I, I was thinking to myself that um, this evolution as a director in a way was forced and kind of grew because of some of this desire to be starting with more personal materials. And it just forces a, a kind of space of communication with the dancers. I mean, I, the language I want to find is that some of the things that I see initially that, you know, go on to kind of inspire the materials are, they have like a, there's like a tenderness around mm -hmm. them and, mm -hmm. and I don't understand them. Mm -hmm. And so just be starting a relationship with a dancer in that kind of space, which has a sort of vulnerability yeah. to it. And, and also creating, asking them to kind of partner with me um, in thinking about some of those things. I think just A, like sets a certain kind of ground. Um, but also as time goes on and we start to build ideas and we start to name things that are shaping a sense of who they are and what they're doing, um, where they are, any of those kinds of questions. Um, I've just become more like my obsession it, more and more is about the management and the exchange of language and ideas between me and the dancers. Mm. You know, it's really like, th that's the space that I feel myself working the most mm. in. Like really, um, trying to like find understanding. Mm. I mean, understanding doesn't actually feel like it's right. Cause it, when, it's really like a magical space for me as a director when I feel those places like we we understand collectively like mm. what we're trying, the significance mm. of a moment. So that would seem to imply that your your relationship with your dancers is very collaborative. Like there's a lot of giving back, back and forth around the creation of these characters on stage or the even the movement. Um, that they're doing uh, or how would you how do you draw the lines between that kind of back and forth with a performer who you obviously need to have a lot of trust with and um your your creative uh, directorial mm. voice i i wish that they could answer that uh -huh. actually because yeah. i would be really curious yeah i don't think that what we do 
like when I think about or my under th there is collaboration that's happening in the room, but <clears throat> I use them dramaturgically. Mm. But I really maintain a control over what's getting authored. Hmm. But both of those things are really, I guess, the, the dramaturgical aspect is really critical and really deeply informs then the choices that I'm making. Hmm. So it's that kind of relationship. Right. Um, which maybe looks like in between the trying of material, the working on material, there are these conversational spaces in the room where we are, we are more collectively kind of in a wondering mm. about this thing and a shepherding mm. of this thing. Um, and then And then, but also, and this is just in the, this is like the brilliance of dance and dancers, mm. but in, in the more like fine tuned um, shaping of material, like as we're building, there are these like, there, there is this play mm. with the dancers around potentials and possibilities. Mm. Mm. And that's also maybe a way to think about collaboration too, right? Right. Yeah. Like for them, for me to wonder, or sometimes I'll ha I'll talk about, I'm thinking about Jordan and some of Jordan's material, which is I would, I would throw to him like, I just, I wish it would like this. Hmm. I wish it would do this. And then he would take that huh. cue and prompt and kind of manifest Hmm. a possibility or you know right. so there it's like that there's all these spaces there too where i'm not alone and there's like there's a partnership hmm. and it, it it comes through from a viewer standpoint as really distinctive individuals on stage you know they each yeah. have their own sort of life and um, presence uh, that feels um, like they have brought themselves to even figured out a way to have them bring themselves to the work um, mm. and inform it in a certain way. And, uh, That's another one I would love to. I'd be curious how they think about where themselves yes, is right. in relationship to what they're doing. Uh. We'll have to ask them later. Yeah, today. <laughs> I just I mean, because I, I think I'm not questioning. I'm sure there it it's I'm sure there is a way that they yeah. are thinking about that. But I yeah. When you talked about that shift um uh, to into this current cycle, if we were going to call it that, um and talked about the psychological um sort of um inspirations, uh do you do you record your dreams uh and do you use your own dreams in any way? Yeah. No, and actually, I think I feel like it's not so much actually like my my sleeping dreaming right. that was informing anything. Yeah. It's more like a a wakeful daydreaming or kind of, and I guess it's more like just um, liminal. <laughs> yeah, and then these times where. I'm just finding I'm finding a workspace in my mind. I'm and the workspace sometimes often is just like bringing my mind to the space of the work. Of this, yeah. You know, so because right. in most cases, the process is instigated by an invitation, right? Right from yeah. an institutional yeah. body and that has a space or something. There's something that there's a place I can wander to yeah and that it's like that practice and just really like allowing that practice which i kind of think everybody or not everybody but i think a lot of artists or a lot of choreographers are probably working that way yeah. 
And I, so it was more just, it's not that it's like a novel thing. It was just more for me to name for myself that that was a really important part of my process. Yeah. Um, and that I wanted to um, kind of respect and honor like yeah. that. Um, <clears throat> but no, I actually really don't remember my dreams most of the time. Yeah which is a weird thing. My, I have a, my husband does like uh-huh. his, he's very aware of like right. his dream life. And I always wake up and I'm like, I don't, I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, well, um, I think about, um, what, uh, I know for the Walker and for me as a curator is such a pleasure is the process of commissioning because it often ends up <laughs> with something quite different. And in your case, delightful, and and wondrous, uh, uh, but very different than what uh, our initial Im- imagination might have been. Mm. So when we talked about Cunningham, and I'd only mm. seen Electric Midwife, mm-hmm. and there was a f- sort of form- formalism about that mm-hmm. work, and a, you know, um, I, I don't know, I just uh, a very you know not Cunningham, but I, I so so we made this uh, commitment and desire to want to support a work just within a frame, not not specifically Cunningham related but a strong individual choreographic voice. And you had entered into this cycle that was quite different. Right. And it was such a pleasure to see Brand New Sidewalk, but it was totally different than what I might have imagined. You know? Totally. And I, I mean, I kind of remember that when the invitation for that project yeah. happened. And I thought to myself, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm really wanting to move away yeah, right. from an association with that earlier right. kind of space. But what a wonderful friction. Yeah, then, totally. You know, because right. I think the project for me with Brand New Sidewalk was like, well, what do I think about formalism? Right, yeah. How am I thinking about that now? And, um, and I felt like that was a really, that was a way for me to think about also how the political is moving through my work Mm. um and which is not maybe i do i feel i mean i'm like i'm like oh why did i bring this up um (laughs) this is great because it was close to what something i was going to ask you but uh yeah i mean i i think that i don't feel I'm interested in the po- the political s- stance almost even feels like the wrong word, but um, but yeah, the the where the pushes mm. for a, for a kind of positionality or a kind of idea um, about the people in the work or the people being used in the work or a larger framework that the work is able to kind of comment on. I'm interested in that and how that's woven into all these other concerns. Mm. Um, But I think that Brand New Sidewalk was a place for me to wonder about, to wonder in a more um, calculated way or, or, or just a more specific kind of way about, um, how identity politics, I don't really like want to say that actually, how identity is moving through formal spaces Mm -hmm. and Mm. also how a notion and a utilizing of the word abstraction is really like kind of flawed and doesn't bend and stretch in the ways that I'm interested in Mm. inside of dance Mm. contexts. Right. I guess you 
answered a question I had, and because the question may have been um, inaccurately conceived, which is, do you find it I, um, challenging or uh, difficult in some way to make work that is more abstract than a lot of work that is happening today and that is carving space for sort of a open-ended freedom of imagination um, that perhaps runs a bit counter to what a lot of work looks like or what um, how work is commenting around identity issues or other things today and does it feel like a, a lonelier you know, place as a choreographer mm. right now. Maybe a little. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't find it hard right. to do it. Yeah. But I don't. I do have questions about its relevance right now. Mm -hmm. um, that that do contribute to feeling or just wondering. About a kind of out of stepness or in stepness with hmm. the times. Uh -huh. um, right. But I guess I also just the the artists that I I feel like the, the artists that I respect the most make the work that they have to make. Right. Yeah. So I think I try to hold that kind of um, clarity right. around what what you're actually able to do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really only able to do and and really I I just I need to do that the work that I can only be where I'm at in the process right and yeah. um at least it's felt for the past few years like that there's been like a i've been like setting a kind of course for myself in a particular sort of thrust and i just kind of need to work that until that's done hmm. i really liked the other day um the star tribune our daily newspaper hmm. sheila reagan did an interview with yeah. you yeah and you referenced um that you're drawn to luring a viewer into a kind of associative thought space, yeah. which was f phrased very nicely, I thought, and wondered um, about, I guess it relates to what we were talking about earlier, is that the openness of people bringing their own interpretation totally. to your work. You know? I mean, this is what I guess I mean when I talk about the failure of, like, or I talk about abstraction, mm -hmm. like, because I think so often, or at least in dance, and be maybe because of the relationship or, or because of the presence of a visual art history, I'm not a historian, so I don't really want to get tangled Rated up in, in yeah. yeah. But my my sort of naive sense is that abstraction, the the ideas around abstraction, got sort of transferred from visual art into a dance practice, which mm -hmm. feels just like not really actually possible hmm. in this this medium requires some different thinking because about of that. the human form exactly and the liveness yes and, yeah and so many things and also yeah the human form the liveness those two yes and so the way i think about and I, I think as a result of that sort of like particular tr translation, um, there's confusion around like the presence of meaning, mm -hmm. which to me, I, I guess, I, it's, it's much more useful for me to think about the movement of the mind and as a viewer, how my mind is moving as I'm watching mm. things. Mm. And, and so I'm really interested in tracking for myself a kind of associative pathway mm. and noticing 
how it's relating to the thing that I'm looking at. Mm. How is that particular imagery, that particular movement, like why are, why are those things moving my mind in that way? Right. Right. And yeah. so that kind of associative space is like really very, very important to how I'm building things. Right. And, um, and certainly it's a big part of like the conversational spaces with the designers too, mm. right? Because they're so, they're, Bailey and Thomas are so, because they're, they're so anchored along with me in the visual. Bailey, your costume designer. Yeah, sorry, and, and Thomas, Thomas Dunn, the lighting, lighting and sort of scenic designer. Yeah. Um, yeah, we are all really trying to track and sort of trace that kind of associative cloud mm. around the work and the sort of like visuals of the work. Right. Yeah. That that trial and error that it sounds like, or the the development process that you use with your designers and dancers together, um, for me, it lends itself toward um, what might be viewed as arbitrary choices, why this then, uh, to have an internal logic that feels right about it um, in terms of each of your choices as the piece evolves. Do you, you mentioned in this interview with the Star Tribune also that the process which was extended due to COVID that you had with Nailbiter um, allowed you to continue to refine and develop the work and you really wanted to nail some things here at the Walker that maybe you didn't quite get to in past iterations. What mm -hmm. were those things specifically that you feel, and did you nail them, mm -hmm. <laughs> that you were able to work on here? Mm. Um, well, in my choreographic domain, um, we had a different opening for the piece mm. before, mm. and I, I much prefer this opening. Um, And that was a conversation with Thomas about a kind of effect and activation of the space. Um, Including the preset lighting. Exactly. Which, which yeah. is really nicely. I mean, you don't really notice. Yeah. And then at some point you realize, oh, I'm, it's already kind it's of happening. begun. Yeah. yeah. I really, this piece feels to me also a little bit like of a love letter to the theater hmm. it's a piece that can't be done in a gallery no it can't right. be done in like a site-specific space it's really like it really utilizes like stagecraft the tools of the theater yeah, yeah. yeah. and that might also be sort of out of step <laughs> yeah <laughs> at the times but i i love the theater and 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 some of the ways that i at least in the talk back I, you know i talked about the kind of histories that I was reflecting on um, just from my own personal dance background as I was like making this piece. That's also so much about a legacy of like stagecraft. Right. And uh. so, you know, anyway, I wanted the piece to start with the space. I wanted it to mm. like, like almost like the space has this, life thrust and this right. kind of activation um it has a new ending mm. the piece at when we premiered it um i had only really gotten my brain so far as to sort of sketch out the gestures for um molly's role mm. on the piano right and then i i was able to figure out kind of between those two that i needed I wanted Jordan to come back out. Um, mm, so, yeah. I love when the stool comes. Yeah, rolling me too. And uh... um, and I also did a lot of work on Maggie's solo, mm. which um, and John and I and John also did some work on the music for that part. Um, and Bailey and I did a bunch of edits mm. to Jordan's costume. And um, and then other little tweaks. But there those were the those were the main things, but they really actually, I think, 
like solidified mm. the work mm -hmm. in, or, or actually kind of ex like expanded it into like a correct kind of place right. that kind of like yeah. held it. So yeah. I don't know. It was somewhat determined by COVID and the other challenges that our fields have gone through and difficulty of um, making work during those two years and things. And I remember our discussions through lots of different stages of just your trying to figure out where should, how should the work live? And at one point, even discussions of maybe it's a film. I and, know. Uh, I feel like there was probably, probably everybody at the beginning of COVID was like, what? should we become filmmakers? <laughs> <Yeah>. You know? <laughs> well, it relates to a question I had because um, there was moments during COVID, yeah, where we wondered, would we ever have the chance to regather people yeah. collectively and be in a space like this and experiencing something? And do you think it, that, that fear and the lack of being able to do that for a year plus um, has led to the kind of sense of deliciousness that you know, I feel in the theater with other people, with a heightened appreciation of just being hmm. in real time together mm -hmm. again and being able to appreciate what theater and performance can bring when it's in a time-based structure. I don't know. I, yeah. I think the other thing is that because I also, around the time of the pandemic, gave birth and became a mom, I just, I feel like before those things, I was seeing shows all the time. Right. And then there was just this long period where right. I wasn't. And yeah. even after the theater still opened back up, it's just a little bit harder for me yeah, to sure. go out and see things. So I feel disconnected from a bigger, from from a sort of like larger sense of what does it feel like to come together in the theater mm. right now. But for me, um, it's just the live, the live is totally different. Mm. You have to be in the room. And that's it right like right. I guess I just you know and my I just like probably most people I'm completely consumed in my screen and you know the t watching tv and everything yeah. and I get right. you know so that you know I, I I do all of that and also there I do still feel a kind of sacredness about live performance mm -hmm. Um, Are you hopeful about its future? Um, I don't know. Yeah. Should I be? I, I, I don't know either. I do think so, but you know, that's... In fact, I, it leads to a question about one of the people you so beautifully honored in, as an inspiration was your original ballet teacher. Mm. Um, and um, Rose Marie Menace. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she, you talked about not only you know what she brought what got into your body training with her but also her tenacity and sort of dedication and i wondered if those lessons of watching this person who was so accomplished you know every day holding class and mm -hmm. sewing things and mm -hmm. you know just staying with it mm -hmm. has um, kept you going at a time when it almost feels like a quixotic, you know, mm -hmm. exercise, being a contemporary dance choreographer, setting mm -hmm. work in real time spaces uh, in America. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I wondered if um, you have to dig deep to be able to, to keep, you know, moving forward, given funding and other challenges uh, um, right now. How is it to be who you are as a creator? And um, how do you find the energy to, to keep making the next piece or the next cycle? Um, that's a very big question yeah. and a really good one. Um, and my mind went a few different places as I was kind of listening to you sort of set it up. I was thinking about Rose and I was also thinking about, um, 
just the ways that I think artists I don't I don't actually want to over romanticize this, which I think happens all the time, which right. is like if you're an artist, you must make art, you know. But I do I think there is a place that you go in yourself. Um to do the to do the thing. And I think you just have to I think there you do start to get a feeling like it's a place you have to keep going hmm. to. Hmm. So there's a little bit like uh not like an addict, but I just, you know, there's something conditioned. Right. Um this this conversation about how to do it in a field that feels like um incredibly challenging um fragile yeah it's such a i just feel in myself like i immediately start to just feel kind of like tired and depressed inside of that kind of mm -hmm. conversation mostly because it just it feels sort of never ending and yeah, it just is right. like this condition right um what's interesting to me is that people still keep doing it and right. i guess that's that obsessional kind of space um and dance has its own a particular like lunacy around that um <sighs> maybe because of the body or and and really like it's amazing to me to think about dancers not not me not the make but dancers and their relationship to the doing and the place that they go and right. how that you know so the field is really a brutal field in particular about around aging you right. know it's so un unkind and um we, I find the field I'm seeing now in a way how much of the field is geared towards a kind of youth culture. Right. Yeah. Um, and because the body can only move in certain ways up to a certain point in age. Um, no, I maybe, but I think it's also about a deeper kind of ageism or uh -huh. um and always in search for the new and things like yeah, that. yeah although I, th I do think there is a way in which the difficulties that y you brought up or the difficulties that are in the field start to feel like an impossible threshold at a certain time right. in life yeah. and there are other things and definitely right. you know for me and my partner is also an artist it's like a two artist family with a kid in New York City is really right feels un, untenable at times yeah um so yeah it's like you start to feel this threshold of like how can how do we keep this going right but all of that is just the question of how like how do we do this thing yeah right but the doing it is um Yeah, I don't have questions about yeah, that. Yeah, right. And I have lots of questions inside of a process. Sure, yeah. But the how to go to the place in yourself or with other people in the room of being in process is just, I don't know, it's a, it's, it's reflexive. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, and that's a real gift, I mm. think, or that that's an amazing thing. Um, and actually a really amazing thing about older artists too, I think, right. or people who really have just been in that reflexed space over long periods and through different phases and right. 
I thought that perhaps was interesting too about your specifically calling out Rose and her influence on you, but also just dances. Maybe it, is it being a mid-career artist when it's giving you the time and maybe having a child to reflect on legacy and the importance of naming those that came before and also protecting some sense because it's such an ephemeral form that we want to hang on to some of those influences and still credit the people who did this work 10, 20, 50, 100 years ago and things. Yeah. I don't know um, if that was part of your thinking about acknowledging Rose so specifically and, um, in the creation of this work. Well, I, I just think that from the beginning of this process, I noticed myself thinking about that time period. Like mm. that time period was really kind of presenting itself to me in a way. In your own personal life? Yeah. As an artist? Uh, yeah. yeah. And just the way I taught in the talk back, I mentioned this, but just the way I was like, I, my mind was like fixating on these objects from the Nutcracker. Yeah. And right. I really didn't understand that, but it just kind of kept bringing me back to that time period mm. and really like the experience of growing up as a girl in the school with lots and lots of other girls doing this weird like ritual that we would do right. of class and then also like putting on these shows so i was thinking about girls and and her and rose and i um anyway so that she was really there already mm. um before she passed away mm. and then and then even after she passed away, I think there were ways, like with this, this drop. This amazing drop. Um, which you that found. But then like right? more overtly, um, it just felt like there's a, there's a presence and there's, but I think the piece is also very interested in dance history hmm. in a way that, or I guess that's me saying, like getting out of saying that, like I, I feel like movements through time in the piece. Mm. Um, and so I think Rose, that school, my history, ballet, Maybe her lineage too, coming from a kind of fractured descendant of like ballet European, russe yeah, and right. just like the significance of that. Right. Um, like that's one, that's only like one part of the kind of way that I feel the piece in a kind of, I guess I'm being tentative just because it's like, it's not like I'm trying to do historical references, right? but there is a sense of like time and history flowing through yeah, the right. work. Yeah. And, and that it's Maggie, I think who performed that yes. balletic sort of section, which was, yeah, I'll take that balletic. <laughs> Surreal really, and also yeah, wonderful all yeah. at the same time. But yeah, I really, I mean, I wanted to, I wanted to find a vocabulary that was like holding um, like a deep felt knowledge mm -hmm. of ballet, but also felt almost like more earthy, almost like more pagan. I'm mm, not quite right. sure that it goes yeah. there yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, I That's still the part that I'm, always kind of trying to draw out, uh, but I wanted it to feel like the pathways that are part of ballet, the form, the lines, the forms, they're there, but their rendering in this iter iteration is 
for something else. Right. It's like not, it's not ballet. Hmm. And, and uh, Jordan's early solo in the work, yeah. there's element, it seemed, I read some elements of almost jazz in it. Uh, yeah, those, I, I feel like those elements have this kind of like, they really, they pop and they identify themselves in that way, like right. really strongly. And there's lots of other things that come together in his material too. But yes, um, yeah, it was important for me. Jazz, in the way that I was just talking about ballet, yeah, and the way that certain kinds of postures forms lines right like indicate and kind of like a line into this idea of ballet right the same thing i mean i'm kind of i guess i'm kind of interested in this in general how to um interrogate these like these codified spaces. Mm. Uh, I also, but at the same, even though there's these illusions um, made, um, your work, like a work like last night, you know, is um, feels so delightfully fresh and surprising at different times. The idios, nice, the sort yeah. of idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic in the best sense of the word, um, gestural language that you find, um, mm. and I wondered how you yeah, continue to Jordan. restore your ability to find that material or to develop it that has this intuitive logic but also continues to surprise and delight an audience in a certain way. Um, you know, I, I still am in a phase of finding the materials in my own body hmm. for the most part i'm sure there are exceptions but working the, through some gestural material before you place it on another on your own body you yeah know? no yeah. like pretty pretty much like writing yeah. the material right um and i think that allows for that kind of idiosyncrasy that you're mm -hmm. talking about mm. because it's just an it's there's like an efficient way for me to to bring that kind of intuitive understanding that yeah. maybe I've been trying to kind of cultivate and also kind of partner with these questions around vocabulary and mm -hmm. around um, style mm, right. and um, and then to be kind of like working all of that in a very sort of spontaneous place. Mm. Um, and then I think I'm, yeah, and I guess, I just feel like my curiosities with vocabulary are very granular. Right. And so, that's the work starts to bend into mm. those kind of granular talking ways right you know uh, yeah because that's kind of like my interest you you alluded to you know working things out writing scripting your work through your own body your own body is in this work as well and uh, yes it and is. i wondered about <laughs> if you could talk about your role which really is feels like a ancient sculpture come to life yeah and what do you think um what do you what do you think <laughs> well I, I i loved that it was like you were both the author and you were kind of this presence in ancient marble or something you yeah. know <clears> that <throat> was off in the corner sliding across the floor with a candle mm. I, I found it visually intriguing and mm -hmm. opened up a lot of interpretive possibilities mm. for the viewer Mm -hmm. How did it feel to be in your own work? And, but in addition, just the oh, other questions. Oh, I, and... I really hate it. I really hate <laughs> doing I, I like. I, I feel like before I walk out of the dressing room each time, I'm just like, I fucking hate doing this. Oh. Um, but it's okay.
Is that um, it's, it's, why did you do it then? I mean, because it felt intentional that you, as this it is. creator, it is. was in this role. Not that like you could have hired a different dancer to yeah, totally. do that. I but. think that that would be a the. I just think that that something would be lost if right. I did that. Um, yeah. Why did I do it? I um, well, in my mind. When I was, you know, conceiving of the piece, I just kept, I noticed that I, uh, because I, I had put myself into Pick and Grove, which is the piece that I made prior to the pandemic, prior to Nailbiter. Right, yeah. And in starting to work on Nailbiter, well, actually not initially. I mean, do you remember, I don't know if you remember, but like in those early conversations around nail biter i remember thinking about like slugs yeah that's these, right like wet this you like sent some wet, images i gooey, think it, yeah kind of right. trailing yeah and i was almost even thinking about like 70s like art happenings uh -huh. and like like a really kind of like messy almost naked body like yeah. that was all there very very early on this has become something different, but in a way also not like totally unrelated. Because um, mm. it does leave that trace. It along leaves the that floor. trace, and it's much more classical. Yeah. Or it feels like it's a con there's like the way you're talking about marble. Yeah. And um, it feels like it's a it's placed. It kind of like conjures a different sort of historical space than like a 70s art happening yeah, but um right. but i kept thinking about i i think at some point i kept noticing thinking about picking grove and my role in that and in particular the thing that i do in pick and grove where i kind of take my top off and i dive into this garbage can of clay and i come out and then it's like i'm covered in the clay and I'm like I, kind of standing in front of a fan. And then there's this, that, that, that hold and that kind of like gesture um, sort of like breaks into this kind of like scramble towards the edge of the stage. And then I kind of just get stuck in the space mm. and And also, I think the way that you were talking about or or the way that we were talking about questions of relevance, I think at the beginning or I think in the middle maybe of Nailbiter, kind of around the time when I was thinking about my my role or the presence of my role, um, it's just like these these kinds of like, you know, anxious fantasies about like, maybe, maybe my work, I'm like not going to keep making work or maybe I'm done or maybe this is um, question, like kind of questions about like my presence mm. in a larger sense and um, in a dan dance ecosystem. Yes. Uh -huh. And then the relevance. And, and so just like many different layers of thinking about death and erasure and kind of life cycle, like right. a field cycle yeah. that is just like right. moves on, you know, yeah. and right. um, lots of things. And so all of that, I think, kind of became sort of compacted into this oh. role, which oh. feels to me like it's a it, it has a kind of like existential presence. Mm. Um, something about like a a yearning and a longing in it and also sometimes some of the postures have a little bit of like anxiety in them almost like a kind yeah. of escaping yeah. or or like Looking leaving away. yeah right. you know and yeah. so trying to sort of pack it with a lot of existential human space. Um, and then also the look of it is, cause it, I do feel like with the piano, yeah, with 
the drop with Maggie's and there is this there and there's this kind of classical right thing that keeps getting kind of like pulled out in this piece um and sometimes my look the marbled kind of thing feels like like right. I'm like a bust a yeah, set, totally. you know or something yeah. like that it's also funny that it sort of speaks to a certain maybe some of what you're talking about a desire for permanence right. a sculptural Stone. thing but right. at the same token you're breaking apart and right, you're right. sliding across the right. floor and you're right. you know moving evolving as a as a figure or character totally and, uh, totally yeah yeah um, i mean as soon as i start to move it's just like yeah, just like crack everything's falling, everything's apart. falling off yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. um i would just like to ask uh, we t- spoke a little bit uh last night about this but your role particularly with Thomas and John, they seem their contributions and Bailey are so heightened. You, you seem almost like in the experience of it, equal collaborate. You, you know, you, you are really creating a whole environment mm-hmm. um, through sound, light, d- design and, mm-hmm. and movement. Um, could you just talk about that relationship with them mm-hmm. and um, how, how you work together? Mm-hmm. Um. Well, John and I have worked together for a very long time and our style of working is really, um, or actually, I guess I'll just say across the board that I really love the taste level of all three of those artists and I really, I trust their instincts Mm. in a very deep way. Mm. So... I don't micromanage. I do my, maybe Bailey and I, maybe I micromanage the most in that vein. In costume. A little bit because of the way that our contributions are so interwoven, like the choreographic. The body. Yeah. 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 Um, And so I do get in there with her and we feel like our collaboration really feels like it has the most sort of like back and forth, mm. the most passes right. between us. Um, and and like we hold a lot of questions together. Um, Thomas, because, you know, light and scenic so often is sort of like a conceptual conversation <laughs> and a logistical conversation. Right. But then when we get in the theater, it's really like this magic yeah. of like fine tuning and bringing it to life. And Thomas's instincts about how to support the kind of choreographic and also about the kind of story that's getting woven through the whole right. are just really brilliant and like so on point yeah. and and i'm so interested in that too and so i feel like we i a hundred percent let him lead and sort of like build that infrastructure and then you know we we talk about the nuances mm. um he really utilized this theater beautifully too. I mean, maybe totally. that was like the similar at Bard, but the fact that we have fly space, the use of soft goods, the way the the lighting was woven from the moment you kind of walk in the theater yeah. the, to the very end, um, uh, and the, just all the different choices really seem to embrace sort of what theater can be, and in this particular space, the things that this theater can do. Yeah. Know. I love the looks of each of the sections, you know? I mean, I was saying last night, like that opening silhouette with Jordan is so, like the quality of the color, the white on the psych, and the way that it creates this almost like matte silhouette. Like I was saying, it was like velvet or something. It was so crisp and like, there's just, the strobing, like there, there's so yeah. many things that are just visually incredible to yeah. look at. Yeah. Um, 
the strobing was a kind of pulse-like quality across the back psych, right? And uh, well, also the color strobe. Oh, sure. In yeah, the those other are so section, strong. And yeah, just so many things. Um, and then John. So I, I was starting to try and talk about John, and you know we've worked John together. John is, is but, obviously sorry, John is composer the composer, and, and um, sound designer. <clears throat> I mean, I, I feel incredibly lucky to have John as this long-term collaborator. It, it's as if, like, I don't really understand my work without his contribution, mm. you know? When John starts to bring materials in, it's like then my work starts to really make sense mm. to me. Is it always new, new sonic material, new composition that he's created for each of your works? And is he creating it with in, simultaneously as you're creating your, your part of the work? Yeah, know? it's always new. Um, we usually have like one conversation early on where I kind of just like spill everything I'm thinking about. <clears throat> and then we go off. Right. And he he has his own work. You know, he sure. has like his own things that he's wondering about and that he brings to the studio and he works on. And he'll send me samples and he always early on is sort of like, I don't know if this is in this project or not, but right. here's something. Right. And <clears throat> then at some point I start sending when I start to feel like I have materials. I send video files to him. And then at some point we come in and with this project, we had a residency at the very beginning at Mansi. Right. And I think we found a bunch of stuff there. Um, maybe, yeah. Had he done the choral aspect yet? No. Yeah. Maggie didn't come in until um, there was an iteration of Nailbiter. The very first iteration was in For River to River. River, to River. Yeah. And it was like a totally, it was basically like an installation. Right. Um, and totally different, but had Marilyn and Jordan and Jennifer Lafferty, right. who was the sort of originator of Molly's role. And, um, and then... And then I sort of felt like I needed, I, I kind of decided on Maggie's section sort of after that iteration oh, okay. going into Bard and brought Maggie in. And, and that's, that's the when crawl. the conversation around that, right. you know, trying to talk to John about like what I wanted that, what I was trying to work on with that section. And then he brought up this idea of uh, a choir mm. and, um, and we were trying, actually, there was a period of time, there was a Georgian choir that was up at mm. Bard that we were really hoping to be able to utilize, yeah. but we weren't able to. And so he kind of brought together, kind of created um, a kind of DIY choir right. to record that. Nice. Um, and last night we talked about his the liveness of his work, too, where he's present is he always will he always be if you take the work other places and is that an important essential part of so he's, he's so. up at the back of the house and he has an accordion he's got some electronics he's using live mm -hmm. as well as then cueing mm -hmm. pre-recorded material like the choral side and things. yeah and that brings a certain liveness even for those who aren't aware that he's performing live as well yeah but, i mean for me at this point what the collaborators are doing is such an intrinsic part right. of the work that Thomas too is. Uh, yeah, yeah. That is I, he queuing things live? live no, there? he's no. not. Yeah, he's not. I mean, that is easier for us to translate. Yeah, and on or the to road like kind or, of yeah, yeah. exactly. But right. no, I think yeah, John's presence is really um, an essential yeah part of the work. Well, I know we've covered a lot of different areas, but I, I have to ask as we wrap up perhaps, is given that you mentioned this may be a kind of wrap up of a certain cycle, 
um, despite the challenges and things, are you already finding yourself interested in um, a new cycle or some ideas and thoughts around um, the, the next work that you may want to make? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I again, this... I've been thinking about um, things that don't happen that often in my work, like touching. Mm. Right. And an ensemble, you and said? And ensemble. Hmm. And I don't know what ensemble means. Right. But yeah, or group or um so I think there are questions I have around like connectivity or right. um relation relating relationship. Um Do you do you find, I also, you have such a theatrical sensibility and I know you've done some work in the more like theater world and uh, do you, are you drawn at all to working as a theater or opera director? And oh, as or, a director? No. Or as a, um, a filmmaker, you know? Uh, as a, uh... I would love, and I will just I'll pitch this to anybody watching. <laughs> you have a project and you want you know, like a movement collaborator, or, collaborator, yeah. please bring me in. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I actually feel really eager and interested and, and kind of like ready to be part of other people's yeah. projects. I don't, I, I love film and I'm so interested in it. And also I don't, I just have so much reverence for how complicated that is that I, right. I don't know. I would, I don't think I have the ambition to have that kind of leadership space, but, um, but certainly I think about the frame, the eye, the, mm -hmm. I mean, the way I'm composing my work from the outside, it, there are, I'm interested in a cinematic hmm. um, viewpoint. Right. Um, I'm super interested also in, yeah, I'm interested in theater and, and I'm very curious about opera, just like the way we were talking about stagecraft right. and like a kind of, like a certain kind of scale and grandeur is like yeah. also really interesting right. to me. So I'm, yeah, yeah. I mean, I need work, so yeah. you know, bring it, bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Beth, thank you so much for being making this work, um, being in relationship with the Walker. I, I appreciated also the relationship we developed with the three co-commissioning partners. Uh, yeah. Lily no longer is with LMCC, but that organization taking a first step, and then a year later, Bard and Gideon and yeah. that whole team coming together and then here at the Walker. So um, it's been a really rewarding and a pleasure to be uh, working with you on the, and having this work come to us. So thank you. Well, I feel so lucky um, to have individuals and arts institutions that have such sort of integrity and guts. And um, thank you wow. for that. Thanks so much. So yeah. till the next time. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs>